Okay, good morning. We begin, we begin with uh, this series of seminars uh, with Susan Hack today and tomorrow. Uh, Susan Hack is a uh, professor at the University of Miami and is, uh, as, it's, as it is uh, well known, uh, uh, one of the most prominent uh, scholars in uh, epistemology, philosophy of science, uh, philosophy of logics, and in the recent years also works uh, in philosophy of law, especially in uh, evidence and law and science uh, uh, topics. And uh, this week is visiting a professor of our, in, in our group. It is a great, great pleasure for us. It is a great pleasure for me that Susan accept, uh, was accepted uh, to, to be here this week and to make three seminars today and tomorrow with us. The first seminar seminar is not the <laughs> seminar that is announced uh, in the in our, in our website it, and it is my responsibility because it's my error uh, then the seminar for today is Federal for today morning is Federal philosophy of science or popper on tile and not proving causation that would be a seminar for tomorrow no, for this afternoon. For, the, for this afternoon. Okay. Okay. For this afternoon. I'm trying to make a rational order. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, it's not easy. <laughs> Susan, Susan sent me an email some weeks ago uh, in stabl establishing the, the order of the, se of the <laughs> seminar and th this, this order is not <laughs> uh, announced currently in, in our website. Then, for today, Federal Philosophy of, uh, of Science, then it's, uh, the, the words is, are, are yours, and thank you, thank you so much for your oh. presence here. El placer es el mío. Gracias. Okay, move, move on. <laughs> Second one. Next, okay. Um, what I'm going to talk about this morning is only federal standards of evidence. Uh, the standards in some of the states are different. And only on standards of admissibility, that means the standards under which a judge decides whether or not a jury may be allowed to hear certain evidence. And now only with respect to scientific testimony. Uh, very, very brief history. Uh, the Fry Rule, which is named after a case from 1923, a criminal case from 1923, said that novel, you have to listen carefully, novel scientific testimony was admissible only if it was sufficiently established to be generally accepted in the field to which it belongs. That's called the Fry Rule. Um, it was a long time ago, but this remains the law in many states, including Florida. And if you ever watch Law and Order, you will know, including New York. Okay. <coughs> uh, in 1975, the federal rules of evidence were promulgated. And Federal Rule 702 said that expert testimony, which includes scientific testimony, was admissible if it was relevant and not otherwise excluded, which sounds much more hospitable than the Fry Rule. Uh, you, you have to be familiar with the common law system to understand how this could happen. For many years, it was completely unclear whether or not the Fry Rule had been superseded. Judges had to make their own decisions about this matter. Until 1993, when the US Supreme Court decided it would... Okay, where are we? See? Okay, yes. Decided uh, to take a case 
in which it had to rule on the question, has the Fry rule been superseded or not? This case was called Dalbert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. Dalbert is the name of the plaintiff. This is the usual way of doing it. And this is the case where Popper suddenly comes into the scientific evidence seen in US courts. Next. Next? Okay. All right. Uh, Dalbert was a toxic tort case involving a drug sold for the treatment of morning sickness in pregnancy, which was suspected of causing birth defects in the fetuses of the women who took it. And Jason Dalbert was, Dalbert was born with a short right arm and only two fingers stuck together on the right hand. This was the first time in its 204 year history that the US Supreme Court made a ruling on the admissibility of scientific testimony. Um, this testifies to the growing importance of scientific testimony in court. Next. Uh, the court ruled in this case unanimously that Federal Rule of Evidence 702 had superseded the Fry Rule but continued that judges are still gatekeepers. What that means is they still have to screen, to filter proffered expert testimony to determine whether or not it's good enough for a jury to hear. And then, this is a ruling only by the majority. There's an interesting partial dissent. The majority goes on to determine whether evidence is really scientific knowledge. Next. The key question is, quotes, whether it can be and has been tested. And in this context, Justice Blackman, who writes the ruling, cites Sir Karl Popper. And indeed, the word testable reminds all of us of Popper's philosophy of science. Next. The very next year, Ronald Allen wrote an article about this ruling in which he said, I might say he was quoting a student of his, um, what the Supreme Court has done is replace a judicial anachronism, that's to say the Fry Rule, by a philosophical anachronism, that's to say Popper. And indeed, if you're talking you know, the sociology of the philosophy of science, yeah, by 1993, Popper was no longer as nearly as influential as he had been decades before. Okay. Uh, there always were rivals. There was inductivism, um, often probabilistic, uh, though not always, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Uh, in 1962, there was Kuhn with the theory of scientific revolutions. And in 1970, there was Lakatos trying to repair something sort of Popperian in a way that accommodated some insights from, Quine, from Kuhn. Next. And by 1978, there was fire up and jumping around at the LSE. <laughs> uh, anything goes. Court jester of the philosophy of science. Ever since, there have been many styles of science studies and so on. And in the mainstream of the philosophy of science, there has been a revival of probabilism, um, usually Bayesian. Okay, next. Um, I began to get interested in what Popper's reputation is now, and it's interesting what I found. Um, Noretka Kurtke dismisses him as, you know, he's very good at slogans, but it's not deep philosophy of science. Um, Rebecca Goldstein writes, uh, you know, I used to think Popper was really hot, but now I think it's just sound bites. Just nice little phrases. Um, David Papineau, who is not known for being a particularly kindly person, writes in a review of Popper's work that he condemned himself to a lifetime in the service of a bad idea. Next. And Ivor Grattan Guinness, who is the nicest guy, um, reviewing, uh, <laughs> reviewing a biography of Popper, uh, says, you know, I'm beginning to wonder if the reason he was such an unpleasant man wasn't that he was so short. Uh, I couldn't resist. I went and looked for a picture of Popper at full length 
This is the only one I could find. And yeah, <laughs> he's the mushroom. <laughs> okay, next. But this is not the real problem. This is not the real problem at all. For one thing, that a philosophical idea is out of date means nothing. Right? What matters is whether it's true. That it's old and unfashionable, well, too bad. If it's true, it's true. The real problem is that no philosophy of science that I know of could possibly be more unsuitable for the purposes to which the Supreme Court puts this than Popper's. That's the real problem. Um, okay, move on. Uh, because the most distinctive feature of Popper's philosophy of science is that no scientific claim, no scientific theory can ever be shown to be true, to be probable, or to be reliable. And that all scientific knowledge is speculative hypothesis. So if you're looking for a test of reliability, which is what the Supreme Court was doing, nothing, nothing could be less suitable than Popper. Next. Um, I think it's perfectly clear that Justice Blackman, who wrote this ruling, didn't understand Popper at all. Um, indeed, one sign of this is that in the same sentence in which he cites Popper, he also cites Karl Hempel, apparently unaware that these are two completely incompatible philosophers of science. Um, I actually made a name in this field by writing in one of my early papers on the subject that the Supreme Court has its hoppers and its pimples all mixed up. Well, okay. Next. Now, I grant you, it's actually very hard to understand what Popper's view is. And the reason, I believe, is that there are two of him. There's the real official Popper, right, with an official story. And then there is the other Popper, the shadow Popper, who backs away from the official story whenever somebody criticizes him. So I'm going to start with the official Popper. OK, next. Um, Popper himself reports that his big idea came to him in 1919. He would have been 17 years old. Think about it. No idea I had when I was 17 was good enough to sustain me for the rest of my life. That we ought to be suspicious simply on this one. Um, how did this idea come to him? Well, there he was. He was a young man in Vienna, you know, a clever young man in Vienna, looking around him. And what did he see? Marxism, scientific socialism. Dreadful psychoanalytic garbage. Azura from, from Freud and from Adler. And on the other hand, Einstein's eclipse predictions, which were testable and were actually tested and which withstood the testing successfully. Okay. So he developed a picture which I will call logical negativism. Not the usual word, but a good phrase for it. By contrast with logical positivism, of course, the Vienna Circle was meeting in Vienna while Popper was thinking about these things for the first time. Um, he wasn't a member, but he attended some meetings. Um, Papineau describes him as moving in the epicycles of the Vienna Circle. Uh, the logical positivists took verifiability to be the criterion of cognitive meaningfulness. Mm -hmm. Popper turns all this on its head and takes falsifiability to be the criterion of the scientific. He always said his entire life, I don't care about questions about words. I care about the world, not about words. Philosophers are obsessed with words. I'm not. Okay, and you'll, this turns out to be um, true in an ironic way, but we'll come to that. Okay, next. Now, core themes. First of all, what does falsifiable mean? Okay. Criterion of something being scientific is that it's falsifiable. What does that mean? It's incompatible with some basic statement. What does that mean? Uh, a basic statement is a statement about an observable event at a specified place at a specified time. Like, um, there's a white swan on the pond out there now. Okay. What falsified means is 
incompatible with an accepted basic statement. Next. Um, some of these you have to keep pressing for the themes to come up. So, okay. um, the acceptance of basic statements, this is a very distinctive Popperian thesis and a devastating one. The consequences are terrible. The acceptance of a basic statement is the result of a decision or a convention on the part of the scientific community. Seeing the white swan might have some causal relation to this convention but it has no epistemological or logical bearing on the truth of the statement. Okay? The acceptance of the statement is entirely a matter for decision. Observation is epistemologically irrelevant. Observation has nothing to do with it, Popper says, no more than my thumping the table has anything to do with it. The only logical inferences there are, according to Popper, are deductive. There is no inductive logic. The whole thing is a mistake. Hume was right all along. And the way science proceeds is by conjecture, which means make an informed guess, and refutation, which means do your best to falsify it. This method only uses deductive logic. The only logic involved is deductive. In particular, the mode of inference it primarily uses is modus tollens, from if P then Q, and not Q, to not P. So if this theory then this basic statement, not this basic statement, therefore not this theory. And the advice given to scientists is make bold conjectures, highly falsifiable conjectures, Test them as hard as you can, and if they are falsified, drop them and start again. Do not try to protect them. Do not make ad hoc maneuvers to save them. Indeed, Popper says, willingness to accept falsification, just drop it if you're shown to be wrong, is a sign of the genuinely scientific, another criterion of the genuinely scientific. And he insists, the probability of a statement is inversely related to its content. The more it says, the more falsifiable it is, the less probable it is. So falsifiable, more falsifiable implies more improbable. So you're to make improbable conjectures. Test them to destruction. Next. Theories which are tested but not falsified are said to be corroborated. Oy. Um, this is a technical Popperian term and the source of much trouble, philosophical and legal. Uh, to say that a theory is corroborated in Popper's sense is strictly and solely to say something about the past. It says, this theory has been tested and it has not been falsified yet. To say it's more corroborated is to say it's been tested many times and not falsified yet, or tested very severely and not. Okay. To say that a theory is corroborated does not imply that it's true, does not imply that it's probably true, and does not imply that it's reliable. Why do I say reliable in scare quotes? Because Popper never uses the word reliable without scare quotes. So much does he dislike the concept of reliability. He always says, reliable? I don't care about reliability. All right. Um, to put it bluntly, this is a covert skepticism. It's not described as a form of skepticism, but that's what it is. Uh, first of all, it will have nothing to do with verifiability, with inductive logic, with confirmation, or even with supportive evidence, or with reliability. All of these are gone. What it urges scientists to do is to make highly improbable conjectures and then show that they're false. In fact, it's a lot more negative than Popper ever admits. Why, why is it more negative than he ever tells us? Well, first of all, because 
if induction really is completely unjustifiable, if we have absolutely no reason to think that the future will be like the past, which is what he says over and over and over, then we have no reason to think that just because this theory passed this test today, it will pass the very same test tomorrow. So corroboration means even less than you thought it did. And moreover, now think about those basic statements. If the acceptance of a basic statement is purely a matter of convention, and what scientists observe has nothing more to do with the truth or the falsity of these basic statements than banging the table does, then there is no guarantee that a statement that is, now I'm doing it, falsified, is false. Okay, and now you get the conclusion, a scientific theory can never be shown to be true, or probable, or reliable, or false. And if that isn't skepticism, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Next. Still, um, Kierkegaard has a wonderful observation about philosophical systematizers, like Popper. These guys who build enormous elaborate theories, he says, are like a man who builds a huge castle. But the castle is uncomfortable and drafty and cold. So he builds a little shack next door and lives in the shack. That's Popper. Um, I don't know how the shadow Popper got taller than the regular Popper. <laughs> uh, this shadow Popper confuses things very badly. He, he, first of all, undermines the motivation for his demarcation criteria. He offers some very nice analogies which are incompatible with logical negativism. He engages in misdirection, by which I mean the kind of thing a conjurer does, you know, I'm now going to saw the lady in half, he says. And meanwhile he's doing this and his assistant is doing something over there and lights are flashing. You don't notice, that's misdirection. You don't notice the lady getting out of the box. And moves. Okay. All right, let's take them one at a time, but I will be very quick over some of these. Um, he undermines the motivation for wanting a criterion of demarcation in the first place. For example, by telling us, oh, my criterion of demarcation is just a convention. Science is continuous with common sense knowledge. Well, why do we care then? And he's completely confusing on the subject of what's being demarcated from what. Theories from other theories, methodologies from other methodologies, it's a complete muddle. I can't sort it out. Uh, and uh, though Marxism was initially one of the supposedly unfalsifiable things, by the time of the open society and its enemies, Popper is writing, well, <coughs> actually Marxism is falsified. So it must be falsifiable, because it was falsified. And the problem is that after it was falsified, they didn't give it up. But that's different. Okay. And by 1971, I, I didn't nearly screamed when I read this, he say, well, you know, so modifying a theory isn't always a bad thing. And after all, somebody's got to defend a theory, otherwise we'll give up too easily. But then the whole methodological advice has collapsed into don't hang on to it too long, which is empty. Next. Uh, he has a couple of really nice analogies. I really like these. I think these are the best things in Popper. Um, one is that basic statements are like piles driven into a swamp. That's, that's sort of right, I think. But it, what that suggests is that basic statements are fallible, not that we never have reason for thinking that they're true, which is what he says. This is compatible with the kind of fallibilism about basic statements, not with the kind of conventionalism that Popper offers us. And then there's a wonderful analogy. I think this is the best thing of all in Popper. Uh, science is like a medieval cathedral, you know, built over generations by generations of specialist workers. You know, some of them only make stained glass. Some of them only carve gargoyles. Some of them only tile floors. It's a wonderful analogy. But, next. If Popper's theory were true, science wouldn't be like a medieval cathedral. <laughs> Each day, you would lay a few courses of bricks, and the next day, you come along with your sledgehammer and... <coughs> okay. 
I should have looked for a picture of Herona Cathedral. That's, that's, that's actually Pisa, but uh, OK. <laughs> there's Popper with his sledgehammer. OK, next, misdirection. Well, I won't, I won't make a big meal out of this, but Popper, after he wrote The Logic of Scientific Discovery, but in time for the English edition, had met Alfred Tarski, had adopted Tarski's theory of truth, and was no longer afraid to use the word true and subsequently developed his account of verisimilitude. But unfortunately, this account of verisimilitude, he cannot connect with corroboration. So it makes no epistemological difference whatsoever. And while he tells us that it's rational to act on a well-corroborated theory, and you think, OK, um, now we're getting somewhere, don't you? You ask why? Why is it rational to act on a well-corroborated theory? And he says, well, best synonym I can think of for rational is critical. So he's turned this thing into a tautology. You know, it's critical to be critical. Well, okay, but that doesn't help. Next. 1972, he goes metaphysical. Uh, introduces the three-world theory in a book called Objective Knowledge. I'll speak for a minute about this because I'm amazed how many people I have met who say things like this. Popper must have a theory of objective knowledge because he has a book called Objective Knowledge. To which I reply, you are very naive. You have to read this book to determine whether or not there is such a thing as the title promises. And what there is, in fact, is a theory about the objective existence of propositions, problems, theories, and the like but no theory about how such scientific theories are warranted. In other words, there is no theory of the objectivity of knowledge, only of the objectivity of the objects of knowledge. Okay, so can we go to point four? Um, this, is, this is getting very legally interesting, actually. Um, Carnap translated some of Popper when none of Popper was in English. And he translated the German word that Popper had used, Bavero, by confirmed. And for a while, Popper, whose English was not very good, didn't realize that this was not what he intended. Then he realized that confirmed was Carnap's word for theories which have shown me shown to be probable. And he said, <laughs> You should never have translated it like this. It was a terrible mistake. I'm never going to use the word confirmed again. And introduced his technical term, corroborated. Unfortunately, he allows some of his papers in which the word confirmed appears to be reprinted without noting that confirmed is the wrong word. I promise you this is legally important. Okay. All right. He also uses words like knowledge and discovery with no connotation of truth, and falsified, as I argued, with no connotation of false. This is a gross misuse of words, and I'm not interested in verbal questions, doesn't cut it as a reply. <laughs> you cannot use knowledge so that it doesn't imply true and get off on the excuse that you don't care about verbal questions. Uh, you might just as well have said sausages as knowledge, if you see what I mean. Okay. All right. So what on earth happened in Dalbert? Well, Federal Rule 702 refers to scientific knowledge. The ellipses are because it actually says scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. So, Blackman argues, courts have to determine whether proffered expert testimony really is grounded in the methods of science. And he says, well, what's the mark of real science? Popper tells us, testability. And he cites, typical of Supreme Court judges, first a law review article, and then Popper. Go. Unfortunately, the paper of Popper that he cites is one of the papers where Popper uses the word confirm instead of corroborate. So naturally, Justice Blackman thinks that Popper is saying the same thing as Hempel. Namely, you test a theory, it passes, it's shown to be probable, and therefore reliable. Okay. 
next. Oh, he also thinks this paper appeared in 1987. 1987 was the date of the most recent edition of the book in which it was reprinted in 1963. It was actually first published in 1957. So if you think in 1993 this is the most recent philosophy of science, you're wrong. Okay. Um, this actually reveals the dangers of that nasty practice that editors sometimes try to impose, refer to the most recent edition of something. It's very dangerous. You can get the chronology all mixed up. Okay. Obviously, um, Blackman doesn't realize. Popper rejects the idea of reliability, hates the concept so much. As far as, far as I'm able to determine, he has never used the word reliable in print without scare quotes. What do you say? Comillas de precaución? Something like that. Anyway. Um, well, where, where on earth does this mass misunderstanding come from? Right? Justice Blackman was not a philosopher of science. Where did it come from? Well, um, let's start with the amicus briefs. These are briefs put in by pe people or associations, not parties to the case, who wish to say something to the court. Um, the American Medical Association. If a hypothesis is repeatedly corroborated by empirical testing, it is generally accepted as valid. Some theories are so thoroughly tested they become virtually incontrovertible. They cite Popper. Obviously, they haven't read him either. <laughs> uh, the Product Liability Council. This is, this is Scientific Method 101. It's what you learn in high school about scientific method. First step for a hypothesis, design an experiment, conduct the experiment, collect the data, analyze the data, publish the results, and ensure that the results are replicable and verifiable. They cite Popper. Uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. This is even more shocking. Um, a hypothesis is accepted as generally valid to the extent that it has survived repeated attempts at falsification. Citing Popper. From the law review paper that Justice Blackman cites. Well, it's like digging for dirt, and the more you dig, the more dirt you find. Nobody understands it. Okay. This is Michael Green. Um, if a hypothesis repeatedly withstands falsification, we may tend to accept it, even if conditionally, as true. He's a law professor. He's not committed himself to anything, really. This is a sociological remark, but it's a grossly misleading sociological remark. I actually called Michael, I know him, and said, Michael, can you remember? Um, I noticed when you put the footnote to this thing, you only put a footnote to the whole of the logic of scientific discovery. Right. I wondered, because you gave no specific page numbers, had you actually read it? <laughs> to which he replied, <laughs> the lie most commonly told, <laughs> I don't recall. <laughs> He cites another law review article okay, by David Fakeman, who writes that the strength of particular scientific statements depends on the extent to which they've been tested. And empirical research might corroborate a hypothesis by finding evidence supporting it, citing Popper. Popper doesn't believe in supportive evidence. He says there is no such thing. Okay, keep going. Okay, so now I understand where the muddle came from, right? But what were the consequences of the muddle? What happened in the federal court after the Supreme Court had told them, look to Popper, look for testability? Well, then Chief Justice Rehnquist in 1993 wrote a very interesting partial dissent to the Daubert ruling. I actually think the dissent contains a great deal of truth. I can safely say that here at the University of Miami if you say, I think Justice Rehnquist was right. You're liable to be assassinated. But anyway, okay. He predicts correctly, as it turns out, there will be trouble about non-scientific expert testimony. Expert testimony covers a lot more than science. Like, you know, the hairdresser who testifies if you perform this operation, your hair should not turn green and fall out. So this hairdresser is incompetent, for example. 
uh, there was trouble, and it was not resolved until 1999 in a case called Kumho Tire. Um, I'll talk to you about that if you ask, but for the moment, to the side. He also writes, <coughs> and this bit had me just, you can imagine how I was laughing when I read this bit. <coughs> I defer to no one in my confidence in federal judges, but I'm at a loss to know what's meant when it's said that the scientific status of a theory depends on its falsifiability. And I suspect some of them will be, too. Boy, was he right. Okay. Um, there is a very, very bizarre example in a DNA case heard shortly after Daubert, the same year as Daubert. An interesting case for many reasons, an early DNA testimony, um, briefed under Fry, but tried under Daubert. And in this case, the defendant produced, wanted, produ well, produced and wanted to present evidence that the DNA identifications made by the F FBI lab were very unreliable and was excluded. And on appeal, it was agreed that it was correct to exclude him because the fact that the methods had been tested and been shown to be unreliable showed that they were testable and therefore reliable. <coughs> Oops. Okay, this is, this is just completely bizarre. Right? Judge Tyler or not. Okay. Um, there are also a couple of interesting fingerprint cases which misinterpret tested to refer to dialectical testing in court. You know, the fingerprints have been tested in adversarial proceedings for a hundred years, they say. Um, when clearly, there's no question that what Popper meant was to refer to empirical testing, not adversarial legal testing. That was what he meant. But these, these, though, these are interesting outliers. Right? The fascinating thing to me is a whole raft of cases in which the Supreme Court's ruling is interpreted as, if you can show that a theory has been tested and has not been falsified, that shows that it's probably true, i.e. reliable. Okay. Let me just give you some of these. Uh, the court must weed out the speculative hypothesis from the tested theory. Of course, Popper says all scientific theories are merely speculative hypotheses. Okay. Next. I've, I've put them in chronological order on the grounds there's no other rational way of doing it. The judge should evaluate the testing supporting the scientific conclusion. Well, sorry, but Popper says there is no such thing as supportive evidence. Well, that, by the way, is from U.S. versus Stasik Peisel, which is a handwriting case where, it's fun for another reason, uh, the court held a Daubert hearing, the conclusion of which was that a Daubert hearing was inappropriate. <laughs> And, all right, this is Three Mile Island. You remember the nuclear power plant that leaked Three Mile Island litigation? The experts excluded because he made no effort to verify either the methodology or the conclusions. But Popper says, you can never verify either the methodology or the <coughs> And um, the expert's testimony had been tested sufficiently to demonstrate reliability. And... Um, one court comes up with a brilliant fudge phrase. It's a fused phrase. <clears throat> Testable hypotheses are subjected to the real world crucible of falsification slash verification and replication. Well, who could resist? Nobody can resist. This is cited over and over and over in other cases. Falsification slash validation. Yay. Complete confusion. Um, and then this last one, it's not the last one, but there is, I've, I've read hundreds of cases and there are scores with this misinterpretation. Uh, this is my favorite. The expert did not conduct any scientific tests or experiments to bolster his theory, nor did he rely on any studies to verify his conclusions, citing Popper. Okay, what about the psychiatric stuff? We, one of the things we know for sure is that Popper meant to rule out psychiatric theories as 
not falsifiable and therefore not scientific. Okay, I couldn't resist this cartoon. It's wonderful, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> It takes a moment before you see what it is. <laughs> but, in fact, US courts routinely admit psychiatric testimony under Daubert. Um, the theory of repressed memory has been established to be valid. The theory of post-traumatic stress disorder or has been found to be substantially accurate. Um, Dr. Blumberg's testimony is based on substantial support from a variety of sources. I found only one case, one case in hundreds, where a federal judge actually read Popper and drew the correct Popperian conclusion. This is US versus Carucci, where the judge writes, the psychological contract offered by the defense suffers from being unverifiable and therefore unfalsifiable, therefore not science, therefore not reliable, therefore excluded under Albert. Amazing. How did Judge Drakoff do it? I know how he did it. He read the same page of the same article of Popper's as Justice Blackman's clerk did. Right. One page of one article. Justice Blackman quotes from the top of the page, Judge Drakoff quotes from the bottom of the page. All of Popper that the entire legal system has ever read, so far as I can tell, is this one page from a 1957 article. Well, of course, none of this is really surprising, is it? I, mean, I would not expect federal judges to know much about Popper, Hempel, Kuhn, philosophy of science. Why should they? Look, the students in my law school classes mostly, have vaguely heard of Kuhn, but know nothing at all about Popper. Very few of them have a philosophy degree to begin with. And anything that they know about Popper, they have learned in law school, not, not in their undergraduate education. And of course, federal judges are taken from the ranks of attorneys who were taken from the ranks of people who went through law school. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfectly intending to poke fun at federal judges and say, you know, you're so ignorant, you're so stupid, this is, this is laughable, though I confess, you know, I did laugh once or twice <laughs> in the course of reading these cases. No, I mean, my, my thought actually is, had they taken the Supreme Court's reference to Popper seriously and actually read Popper, and discovered what he actually said, the results would have been catastrophic. Right? Because Popper's philosophy of science is so totally unsuitable for the purpose. Right? So what they did, which was not unreasonable in my opinion, was sort of cook up, um, uh, we say half-baked in English, um, no, uh, an incomplete uh, makeshift philosophy of science of their own, in which it's an important thing that a claim be tested, but it's not, if it passes the test, that suggests that it's a good theory, and you expect that it will pass the next test of the same kind. And if it's been tested in a lot of circumstances and has held up, then it's as close as you can get judicially to a sign that it's a reliable theory. But I actually think that that story is quite close to the truth. <laughs> the, the mock popper that federal judges, on you know, the majority of federal judges created for themselves is a lot closer to the truth about science than the real popper. But of course, the, the federal judges don't actually have a theory about science that does the job. They just have enough to work with, but there is no philosophy behind it. And so naturally, okay, um, we should be on the one with the picture of the book. Mm -hmm. That one, yeah, okay. 
Federal judges don't have a theory, but I do. And you know, the next question that occurs to me is, well, would my theory actually do the work that federal courts need to do? Is it, is it a theory that would actually support what they are doing under the mistaken impression that they're applying Popper's theory? I think the answer is yes, but what I find, okay, I'm presenting this in, in a way which is not the way I would present it in the book. Okay. This is presented as how my theory contrasts with Popper, so that you can see how I avoid the difficulties into which he walks. Okay. Um, I wouldn't give him this much importance in the presentation of the theory in any other context, but in this context it seems like the right way to do it. So, first move, just get over the preoccupation with demarcation. I think caring too much about whether something is really science or not is a mistake. Um, indeed, I think that the Supreme Court discovered this. Perhaps if I may, I'll say a little bit about Kumho Tyre. Kumho Taya versus Carmichael was a case where a man who had been involved in a uh, motor accident in which his tire had blown out sued the manufacturer of the tire claiming that the reason for the accident was not that the tire had been misused or was too old or that he was going too fast or whatever but that the tire was badly designed so that the manufacturers would compensate him for his injuries. And the expert involved was an expert in motor tires. Since Daubert, every expert has to have a methodology and the tire expert said he had a methodology, <coughs> a visual inspection methodology. He meant he looked at the tire visual inspection methodology, I love that. But what the Supreme Court had to decide when Kumho Taya came to them was, does our decision in Daubert apply to non-scientific experts like this tire expert? And the conclusion was, yes, it does. And as they drew this conclusion, Justice Breyer, who wrote this ruling, said, of course, what really matters in that formula in Rule 702, scientific, specialized, or other technical knowledge, is the word knowledge, not the word scientific. So worrying about the demarcation of science was the wrong way to go anyway. Okay, well, actually, I think that's right. Um, and it's right as philosophy of science also. Um, if you Okay, the first thing to do is to stop using the word science as a generic term of epistemological praise. It's very common. Um, I don't know if you had these in Spain or if any of you are old enough to remember them, but I remember in England advertisements for detergent, biological detergent, which allegedly contained bacteria which ate the dirt. They were advertised by actors wearing white coats. Yeah, they have a slide roll in there. Okay, that's how old they were. And they would say, buy new scientific wizzo. It gets your clothes even cleaner. Well, that's what I mean by the honorific use of the word science. It's just a term of praise. Scientific means good. <laughs> It's very common. You find it everywhere. You find it in Dalbert, among other places. Uh, but if you stop using the word science as an honorific, generic term of epistemological praise, you are able to do the following things. You can say, look, there is bad science and good science. Not all science is good. Some of it's weak. Some of it's trivial. Some of it's corrupt. And you can also say, if you're presented with bad science, 
Okay, you feel an obligation to say what's wrong with it. Right? It's too vague. Or the experiments were badly designed. Or the records were poorly kept. Or the tables don't in fact represent the data that were... Uh, whatever. But you will say something specific and not just, yeah, it's pseudoscience, it's not really science. Okay, next. But when we stop using science, scientific, etc., as honorific terms, we see that the fact that a purported explanation rules something out actually is a reason for thinking it's really an explanation, not for thinking it's really a scientific explanation, because this applies to non-scientific explanations also. And the willingness to take negative evidence seriously is a sign of an honest inquirer who may be a scientist or may be a historian or a legal scholar or whatever. Um, Darwin writes in his autobiography that he kept a special notebook marked negative evidence in which he put all the things he learned on of that he couldn't explain. It's interesting, isn't it? Why? He said, because I remember the positive evidence. I forget the negative stuff. And I think that shows you what's going on. It's a sign of the honest inquirer. Take negative evidence serious. Okay. Right. <clears throat> and I think the best way to use the phrase, I would prefer always to talk about the sciences anyway, to acknowledge that they're not really all they don't work all quite in the same way. Uh, it just refers to a loose federation of kinds of inquiry. Some of them tightly interconnected, some of them at the moment at least still very loosely, fluidly interconnected. And distinguishable from, <coughs> from history or legal scholarship or, or, or biblical study or whatever by their subject matter. Okay. Um, Okay, on the subject of scientific method, I have a view which I think is moderate, but that other people seem to think is radical. There is no scientific method, I would say, just as Fire Oven did. This doesn't mean anything goes. What it means is that there are underlying methods that anybody inquiring into anything uses. Well, make a conjecture. Figure out what the consequences would be if it were true check out how well they stand up to the evidence and then decide, get more evidence, dump the conjecture, modify the conjecture. You just have to use your judgment what to do from there. And on top of this, in the sciences, there are up to up kinds of helps to inquiry developed over hundreds of years. You know, I would say, this is crude list, microscopes, telescopes, Questionnaires. These are ways of getting information. Um, numerals. First Roman and then Arabic numerals. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but Roman numerals are actually a huge impediment to serious mathematical work. If you consider what it would be like to do long division in Roman numerals, it's terrible. It used to be a university subject. It was so hard. So Arabic numerals, the calculus, the computer, and all the, all the social mechanisms like peer review for grants, peer review for publication, this kind of thing, uh, for keeping people honest. So it's no mystery how the sciences have progressed because they have the underlying general methods and numerous specialized helps, but there is no scientific method used by all and only scientists. And then this part I'm going to jump over quickly. Um, you can ask me to go back to it, but to do it properly would take an hour, and I don't have an hour. Um, of course, the conventionalism about basic statements has to go. It's clearly crazy, isn't it? It's, you know, why do we think there is a bottle of water here? Oh, well, we just make a convention to accept the statement there is a bottle of water in front of Professor Hark at such and such a time on such and such a day, in such and such a place. It's local, no? That's, that's, we don't make a decision to accept it. You can see it. I can see it. We can verify that there is a bottle here by looking. Okay. Um, so the conventionalism about basic statements has to go. 
Uh, but what that means is that we need a whole different story about the, the, the epistemological status of claims about what you see. I have such a theory. I'm not going to try to present it to you here. If that's what you most want me to do in the question period, that's what I shall do. Okay, can we step, skip to step, step four? Um, this, of course, means that you can't do what Popper wants to do, epistemology, without a knowing subject. If you're going to let observation play a role, which I am, then since it's people who see things and hear things and smell things and touch things, then you have to let the people back in. Okay. Uh, this means, this actually has very serious consequences for how you construct a theory about the warrant of scientific claims. You have to begin with the evidence possessed by an individual and then I believe construct an account of the warrant of a claim for a group of people given their shared evidence and then move to an account of the warrant of the claim at a time. Okay, this is all very difficult epistemological stuff but it has to be, I believe, in that order, because observation must play a role. Okay. Uh, then, step five. Well, we need a theory of evidence. Um, I'm going to give you two lines about this now, because this afternoon you will see my theory of evidence at work on complicated testimony about causation. Okay. So, for now, I'll just say this. My idea about the structure of evidence is it's not a chain. It's not like a mathematical proof. It has the structure of a crossword puzzle. A crossword, crossword puzzle. A crossy grammar. Huh? Um, and how strong the evidence is um, has three dimensions rather as how reasonable an entry in a crossword is. Okay, I hope you have some familiarity with crosswords. Think about this one. On what does its reasonableness depend? Well, how well is it supported by the clue and any other entries that intersect with it and, of course, any of those that... In okay. How reasonable are the entries that intersect with it independently of the fact that they intersect with this one? Right? Because you don't count twice. And how much of the crossword have you done? Right. The more of it you've completed consistently, the more reasonable each of them becomes. By analogy, okay, I guess it's a very legal way of thinking, but analogously, the three dimensions of the quality of evidence, according to me, are how supportive it is, how secure the reasons are independent of the claim in question, and how much of the relevant evidence it includes. Supportiveness, independent security, comprehensiveness. Um, let's skip the next one because that will be will come up again this afternoon. What makes evidence supportive? This one I have to talk about because Popper denies that anything can do that. There is no supportive evidence. I think what makes evidence supportive is how well the evidence fits together with the claim in question to make an explanatory account. And because explanation is vocabulary dependent, this means supportiveness is not a purely formal matter. It's not a matter of inductive logic because it's not a matter of logic. It's not formal. It depends on content. Parentheses. Everybody should have known this at least since Nelson Goodman published his paper on the Grew Paradox. Hempel drew this conclusion in 1964. Nobody, apparently, paid any attention. But this is the conclusion of the Grew Paradox. <coughs> if that was unintelligible, ask me afterwards. Okay. Um, Verdul is the Spanish word for Grew, by the way. Okay. Uh, so, supportiveness depends on content, and in particular depends on how well the scientific language fits the world, which in part explains why scientists are constantly revising their vocabulary. Okay. Next, 
Um, oh, okay, we got this one. I got this one twice. Never mind. Last step. Popper, like almost everybody in his age, thought of scientific rationality in terms of logic. If it's rational, it's got to be logic. If there's no inductive logic, it has to be deductive logic. I say, no, the, the answer to this problem is, it's not logic. It's not that logic plays no role, but it can't exhaust the philosophy of science. It depends on how we are. We have senses, we have brains. It depends on how the world is. The world is not completely random and chaotic. Things are of kinds, and kinds of things behave alike. If this weren't the case, we couldn't do science. Science would be impossible. And, okay, next to last, if any real inquiry is possible, I'm not trying to answer the skeptic, but if any real inquiry is possible, if we make informed guesses, we devise ways to check, to test them, and we check how well they stand up to evidence. Yeah, each step is fallible. Progress is ragged, it's not even, it's not guaranteed. But this is how, very gradually, very fallibly, the scientists have built this wonderful, incomplete cathedral. <laughs> um, in case you're wondering, that's Polish. <laughs> I haven't been doing PowerPoint very long, um, but since I've learned it, I've tried to learn how to thank my audience in whatever language I'm dealing with, so you can tell where I have taken PowerPoints so far. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you so much.